Ja. Ja, moin. Ja. Well, I thought with this, with this um, meeting, we just kind of uh, catch up and I'd go over a little bit of the introduction and discuss some uh, questions that are lingering um, before we move into more of the theoretical uh, account. Obviously with Father Peter, he's always dealing with uh, the historical, methodological and more speculative aspects all at the same time. But I think um, where we left off was at the end of chapter five, which was really the end of kind of the uh, historical introduction. And what you find in what follows is, is a recapitulation of much of the uh, same material, but now with a very laser-like focus on the um, theoretical aspects or theological and philosophical aspects. And uh, I think in terms of the layout and outline, it, he does a pretty good job at uh, accomplishing and moving through the various parts and points that he wants to make in a systematic and I think intelligible way, um, even if some of the um, even if some of the prose itself is difficult to wade through at times. <clears throat> so I think very important is to, again, um, and it's typically Bonaventurian, is to get a good grasp of the structure and outline of uh, the argument, because in many ways that will reveal uh, the main point. Um, the structure of the text will help um, elucidate the message that's being, can, being uh, presented in the text. Um, <clears throat> there, was, there was another item that I wanted to um, mention. Oh, um, this lecture is a, a bit more informal. Um, I, I lost hearing in my left ear, so I need to go uh, get that addressed. So it's a bit of an irritant right now. Uh, so bear with me. That's why I have it in my right ear. It might look like the left ear to you. Um, so it's a little bit, I've been a little bit distracted with that this morning. So uh, pardon me if um, I'm not as uh, present as I, as I normally am. Um, but uh, so that being as it is, I don't know if this should be, if you want to put this up on Air Maria, that's fine. Um, but I think now we've gone 14 weeks, so we have eight weeks left, and I think we have six chapters of the book left to work through. And so that, I, I really want to uh, work through these chapters fairly quickly. Um, I don't foresee, although um, uh, the best laid plans, of course, are, uh, they go off to rye. Um, I don't foresee going with a fine tooth comb through every single detail. I want to hit the main points. Um, and try to provide the, the essence or core of the position that Father Peter is arguing um, on the basis of Colby and his own tradition. Um, <clears throat> so at, at this point, uh, we finished with uh, chapter five last time we met. And that was really, you know, the end of his um, historical account of the, the motivation for the, the um, formulation of the MI and the Cities of the Immaculate, how he understood that in relation historically as a development um, within the Franciscan order, the, co the context to which or in which he was responding and um, formulating his uh, view of the, the role of Mary in the order and in the church. Um, <clears throat> and then um, how this, how this began to take form. And so some of the initial objections and his response. And the next section moves from uh, more of a historical account to, again, the theoretical account. So if, if the first half gave some arguments of why this is important and how he's dealing with and to what he's responding and to whom he's responding, now he's going into, uh, Father, Father Peter is going into the theoretical justifications. And it's important to understand the structure because part three, let's see, we have three basic parts left. And so part three is uh, a more Bonaventurian emphasis uh, because what St. Maximilian is doing, so Father Peter argues, is he's establishing the whole notion of the golden thread. Uh, the cause of the Immaculate in the Franciscan order as both a foundational and guiding principle, but also as the only unifying principle for the or between the Franciscan order. So the cause of the Immaculate, in a sense, provides that unifying idea that is at the core of the Franciscan charism 
to rebuild my church in a Marian mode. And so what St. Maximilian is saying is that St. Francis had a primordial encounter with Christ, but it's in, a, it's in an essentially Marian mode. I think if you look to the, uh, the biography of, of St. Francis, remember he's a soldier a couple of times, he comes back, then he has that encounter with Lady Poverty. And of course, who is the queen of all virtues? It's, it's Our Lady, obviously. So he already had a strong devotion and he had an encounter with poverty. Kind of, I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to put it on a parallel, but it hearkens to maybe Soloviev's encounter with Sophia. But, but this is interesting in the biography and life of St. Francis, because for Maximilian, following St. Bonaventure and really the Franciscan tradition, St. Francis is an antitype, in a sense, of Christ. But he becomes, through his own transformation in Christ, this radical transformation that culminates in the stigmata, but is lived out in penance and in poverty. Um, he uh, is also then a, a, a theological locus for the Franciscan order, and really for the church at large. And what I mean by that is perhaps helpfully uh, compared to how the Hesychasts and Hesychasm functions in the Byzantine East. It's not as though he becomes a source of revelation. No, the revelation is um, materially presented in scripture and then formally extended and presented and manifested and preserved by the church's teaching function and the sacramental um, life of the church, the sacramental order of the church. But nevertheless, theological reflection can take place uh, in, on, on many points. And so in, in that sense, St. Francis's life as this uh, truly Catholic and apostolic man becomes an object of reflection. Why? Well, because he, in a sense, in the history of the church, is, is, is a, a unique instantiation or manifestation of total conformity to Christ and total divinization through the power of the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, he um, manifests and, and, and embodies that call of St. Paul to bring forth Christ in oneself, and he does this in a Marian mode. And of course, this is very important because St. Francis explicitly calls Saint, uh, calls Our Lady uh, spouse of the Holy Spirit. And this is important for uh, St. Maximilian's own development of pneumatology and especially his positive understanding of the Immaculate Conception. And so St. Francis begins with this Marian moment, this, this moment um, disposing to conversion, right? He, he, he encounters Lady Poverty. And then what does he do next? The, one of the next major events in his life is, of course, his experience of Christ speaking to him from the, 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 the cross at San Damiano, the San Damiano cross, I mean. Um, <clears throat> and then with this moment of explicit or formal uh, clarification, even though it wasn't exactly clear to St. Francis how he would do it, but he took it literally and also then uh, anagogically it extended to the founding of the order. He, he experiences Our Lady, then Our Lady shows him Christ. Christ shows himself in the church, in the, con in the maternal context of a church. And then what does St. Francis do? He then goes and establishes the Portiuncula, which is our church of the Lady of, of, of the Angels. And so in a sense, there is this, this Marian um, anticipation and disposition, and then there it's mediated through the concrete reality of the sun in conformity to the sun and then it's manifested again in the ecclesial mode of the church so you have mary as kind of collaring or coming before and after as as um anticipating the birth of christ in its fullness in francis and then when that birth takes place that becomes saint francis in a sense becomes um an ecclesial man in a Marian mode. So I think this is, a, this is a quite important in understanding the golden thread, because clearly the golden thread for St. Maximilian is the cause of the Immaculate. <clears throat> and um, there are good articles by uh, many scholars. Uh, Father Johannes Schneider obviously has written and published uh, with the, um, the FI uh, a, an article and a major book arguing that St. Francis is essentially affirming the um, Immaculate Conception and the absolute primacy of Christ. But when you get to someone like St. Bonaventure in the milieu of, the, uh, of Paris and the uh, great influence, both at Paris and the kind of quasi-magisterial 
function that the university had and the strong disposition against both the absolute primacy and the Immaculate Conception at Paris, St. Bonaventure doesn't articulate or draw out the implications of St. Francis's more intuitive, uh, mystical and spiritual relation and then articulation in poetic form of the Immaculate Conception and the primacy of Christ. But nevertheless, St. Bonaventure still gets the, the basic dispositions and themes of St. Francis and in a sense translates St. Francis into biography and hagiography and at the same time translates St. Francis's experience into uh, a properly um, academic mode, that second mode of theology that St. Bonaventure articulates in <clears throat> that, that comes between the symbolic mode and the contemplative mode, the properly academic mode of theology that comes between these two uh, modes that correspond again to the various powers of the soul, the, the theological virtues, uh, as well as the three persons of the Trinity. There's this triadic uh, typology or taxonomy in Bonaventure that runs all throughout his uh, theology. So what's important though with Bonaventure is he understands very clearly the role of Mary and the centrality and priority of Christ, even if he doesn't draw explicitly all the conclusions. Um, and then when St. Saint, Saint Francis is translated into something that can be participated in and imitated in various degrees through the first, second, and third orders, and then also brought into academic discussion, then you find <clears throat> a, a, a fuller and then a continuing flowering of reflection upon the theology of St. Francis, the lived theology of St. Francis, as then mediated and continued through Bonaventure, and then finding, in a sense, its key distinctives, very explicit distinctives <clears throat> in terms of concrete statements of the absolute primacy of Christ and the immaculate conception in somebody like Duns Scotus. And so this, this is how St. Francis, I mean, St. Maximilian is drawing together the golden thread. It's always the understanding of the priority and primacy of Christ and the Marian mode of not just the economy of salvation, the economic trinity, but the order of creation as such. There's a, there's a priority of Christ. Christ is the middle of all things. He's the exemplar of all things. And the way Christ is brought to the world and the way that Christ uh, manifests himself to us and we return to, and, to Christ and through Christ to the Father is in this Marian mode. <clears throat> and so St. Maximilian is just simply pinpointing that there always is this understanding that with St. Francis, I mean, yes, with St. Francis, there is this dual this, in, this inextricable relationship between Christ and his mother that is as inextricable in the economy of salvation of the relationship between Christ and his father in the spirit uh, in the eternal trinity. There's an inextricability based upon the good pleasure of God to manifest himself in this way. And in so manifesting himself this way, he then manifests the <clears throat> ad extra missions of the son and the spirit in Christ and in and through Mary, and thus manifests a Trinitarian mode of theology that, that establishes and, and is the dynamic unifying principle of the um, entirety of theology in the economy. So what, what, what Scotus calls the uh, contingents um, it also has this Trinitarian structure precisely because of its Christological um, emphasis and priority and finality all at once in a Marian mode. So these, these are all important themes. So the first question that um, <clears throat> Father Peter wants to tackle is how does St. Maximilian understand and why does he understand the cause of the Immaculate as the, the leading idea, leading principle? Of the Franciscan order. <clears throat> and then the second idea is what does this, what does this, in this historical articulation of the golden thread, how do we understand then the progress of history, both within the order, with respect to articulating the cause of the Immaculate, <clears throat> as well as the order's place within the, the broader church and the mission of the church to uh, bring the gospel to all nations and bring all nations into subjection and love of Christ. <clears throat> and so you have a statement about the foundations 
in the cause of the Immaculate. And then you have an articulation of a theology of history in which um, metaphysics, meaning the, the will of God centered on Christ and moving in and through this Marian dynamic is ordering and structuring the real progression or spiritual evolution in the church, such that the church ever becomes more perfectly throughout the ages, uh, conformed to the will of God and manifest in that spousal relation, that spiritual spousal relation that Jesus and Mary had as Mary as the queen mother and <clears throat> Mary as also the mother of the church. So Mary is the mother of the head, Mary and the body. And there's there's this um, dual relationship in terms of mediation, uh, both of head, Mary mediates the head, but she also mediates the body. And so there's this, this, this inextricable nexus. And so we have to understand how the golden thread informs and in a sense guides the, the real progression of history. And this is where uh, St. Maximilian being read in conjunction with St. Bonaventure and especially his theology of history in the uh, Collations and Hexameron are, will become very important because what you find is you find um, an attempt and I think rather successful uh, in terms of theology to integrate history and metaphysics. And ultimately in that sense, scripture and metaphysics because scripture is a metaphysical book and a historical book. So how do you bring those two things together? How do you understand unity yet in a true form of development without um, contradicting the original um, the originality of the source and the type. How do you how do you how do you grow without becoming something you are not in a in an ontological sense? <clears throat> and so that's uh, part three. That's chapter six and seven. And then moving to part four, uh, Father Peter moves into a more explicit discussion of the will, and this is very important because if if Saint Maximilian is articulating the 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 fundamental uh, or, or formal note of the purpose of the order in terms of the golden thread, and then in terms of the two pages and a real development, what, what, is the, what is the engine of this progression within the order and then within the broader, the order's relationship to the broader church and the world? Well, it's a metaphysics of the will. And here he moves into a more of a discussion of Duns Scotus and how Scotus articulates <clears throat> and perfects the Bonaventurian approach to the will, and then how Colby recapitulates this Scotistic and Bonaventurian conception of the will, and then brings that forward into the, um, his theologizing, again, building upon Mary as spouse of the Holy Spirit and Bonaventure's um, understanding of the universal mediation of Our Lady and then the definition of the Immaculate Conception. First, the theological articulation in the Franciscan school and its defense, and then the dogmatic definition in 1854 as a recognition and ratification that that position is in fact the teaching of Christ. How does this, how does Colby understand and insert the will and the primacy of charity into his own understanding and articulation of the theology of Our Lady as Immaculate Maternal Mediatrix and the Holy Spirit, to, whose procession is precisely according to the voluntary mold, mode. And he is, in a sense, hypos, hypostatic love between the Father and the Son. So there's, how do we understand the will, both in, its terms of the, in terms of the progression of history, the will as a metaphysical reality in the progression and development of history? Well, he then says, well, this must be understood ultimately on the will of God and the will of God as revealed and manifest in that identity of wills, that love relationship, that perfect immaculate love relationship between the Holy Spirit and, the, um, and Our Lady. And that is the condition for um, the divine mater maternity. So the immaculate conception then is the efficient and first condition for the divine maternity itself. Uh, <clears throat> So those are, those are chapters eight and nine, the whole issue of the primacy of charity. So you're moving from uh, a, th a, th a theological understanding of history in the Franciscan order, and then you, you move to, well, how does this actually play out? 
How do we understand how this is possible? Well, this is through the primacy of charity. Well, how do we understand the primacy of charity? Well, in the philosophical anthropological realm, you have to have uh, an understanding of the will. And in the theological realm, in terms of the concrete players in this, you have to understand who our lady is and who our Lord is in relationship to the, the father and the missions, the ad extra missions of the spirit uh, excuse me, the Son and the Spirit. And then finally, uh, part 10, I mean, part 5, chapter 10, this deals then with, we've, we, have, we have the history, we have now the, the, um, the principles of development and understanding the will, and we have now a theological understanding of the relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit, and of course, the relationship between Christ and his Father, and then his mother, well, how do we put this into practice? And this is where Colby then says, as St. Francis, in a sense, incorporated Christ in his own body, right? Through the patronage of Our Lady and the, the, the tutelage or tutelage, the teaching of Our Lady, so also then <clears throat> the Franciscan order is called through the establishment of foundations such as your own that are meant to become cities of the immaculate and within the broader Franciscan order, create the, uh, the cities of the Immaculate in order to fully incorporate the reality of what the Immaculate Conception is in the theological and practical realm, precisely through understanding the history and purpose of the order, and then the, the acting upon it in real time uh, in terms of the primacy of charity. And so the, the final section, chapter 10, is what he calls the uh, synthesis of Colby and Mariology. And he wants to deal again with two parts. How do you incorporate in the second page that immaculate conception into the life of the order and for and, and the life of the order for the sake of the church? Because again, we're the, the Franciscans are in following St. Francis, uh, totally Catholic and apostolic. So it's not meant to be entirely or exclusively internal, but clearly one must become pure himself before he can purify others in this relative sense. So the order, by becoming more Marian, at least in certain components and elements, will, in a sense, bring to a greater perfection the uh, reality of the Franciscan order in becoming ever more closely conformed to what St. Francis actually was. Because uh, St. Bonaventure uh, admits, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, that the spirituality of the Franciscan order at the time when St. Bonaventure was writing did not match, right, the reality of St. Francis himself. So, Saint, so in a sense, we compare as Franciscans ourselves to St. Francis, but St. Francis, in a sense, as founder, stands in a relatively transcendent position. So in, in one sense, St. Francis is the, the paradigm and exemplar of Franciscanism, but Franciscanism doesn't match. I mean, it's, empir it's empirically verifiable. It doesn't match the charity and holiness of St. Francis. And so what Bonaventure says, if you understand this progressive aspect of theology, and then St. Maximilian takes this forward through his speculation on the immaculate uh, and maternal mediatory reality of Our Lady, he says, well, clearly the order can grow in holiness and perfection. And so this is what St. Maximilian is understanding about the function of the, um, the Marian consecration and the vow of Marian consecration and the role of the MI in bringing both the Franciscan order to a greater state of spiritual perfection in closer conformity to St. Francis himself, but also in that sense, as they incorporate the mystery of the Immaculate Conception in practice, not just academically, they also then become a perfecting agent of the broader church, bringing the whole church to that um, greatest or greater state of conformity to um, uh, our Lord and Our Lady. <clears throat> and so chapters 10 and 11 deal with uh, how is this, how does St. Maximilian understand this should be brought about um, in practice. And then if he, if, 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 if he has a vision of how it's to be brought in practice, what are the, the means 
to uh, bring this about. And this is where, where he develops the whole issue of uh, the MI, uh, the, 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 the uh, confraternity of the Militia Immaculate. And so those are, that's basically what we have left in the course. And I think um, with only really six chapters and a conclusion, I think we can finish this up in the remaining uh, 16 weeks, even taking this uh, lecture more for uh, just basically catching up because it's been so long, I've forgotten some of and much of what I said. And uh, I'm sure there are questions uh, remaining or moving into uh, the, the, the rest of the book that may be helpful to uh, get us going. So feel free, I mean, we can just have a, a conversation at this point. Um, if you'd like to review what we've talked about already, it's all on YouTube if you want to go and spend, well, that's why this is spend, spend a week watching your... I, I spend every week watching my children and I, it's, it's, it's painful enough watching, hearing myself talk. Uh. <clears throat> there was one interview that asked Jordan Peterson if he goes on YouTube and watches the, uh, the compilations of him dunking on interviewers asking stupid questions. They didn't quite say it in that way, but there's a lot of Chester, or, uh, Peterson crushes. And so the interview I asked. Haven't, I, haven't, interview, I haven't seen that. Okay. But uh, yeah, he asked, you know, do you go on and watch? Like, oh yeah, I really got that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, so yeah, I looked at the introduction a bit. And um, it was uh, looking at the wrong introduction. Um, so I thought it was interesting, this idea of like the evolutionary, I didn't quite get the point of that where it seems sometimes as if it was just taking a, uh, a popular buzzword and then incorporating it in some way into your own thought. Um, mute. You're on mute somehow. Sorry, sorry. Um, I was looking a bit and it was, I thought it was interesting talking about the evolution and it was a bit more understanding that basically the act of creation is ongoing and peaks with the Immaculate Conception, with the coming into the world of the one who is made worthy to bear God. And um, so you have this idea where it's almost more like evolution in general is being drawn towards and it maybe it's like to a, a point. And um, I think I thought that was interesting because I also recently read a book on, you know, cashing and just in spiritual theology in general, where the development is generally towards a simplification in the spiritual life and the intellectual life. And that I think ties into the fixed and firm idea of Colby, where it wasn't like the mono, uh, monomania, mania. yeah, monomania, but that it was rather this sort of I think, uh, I think, we, okay, I think we lost you. I think he shouldn't say, I shouldn't, I don't think he should say monomania. I think he was fixed in a moment. I don't know what's going on. It looks like both the friars froze. Oh, no, well, Fra Joseph Pio's here. He's, he's moving. He's showing signs of life. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what? <clears throat> oh, there he oh, is. There he is. There he is. Okay. We, we missed you. You froze. You didn't cut out. It just. Uh, oh, yeah. I just. I switched to the the phone right when it reconnected. So oh, okay. Up, up, 
at times the Wi-Fi is not reliable when it comes to yeah. the load. Um, but anyway, so yeah, just uh, just putting those together where you have that contemplative focusing, where as you go on on the spiritual life, there's this simplification down to sort of one thought and one act of love, even though that's manifested at different moments in different ways. And then where it's talking about the evolutionary transformism, it's not just talking about how things change, but like you said, that they're going towards a point um, or that this is the Marian aspect is something being drawn out and it's a step. Um, and that's where he also brings in mention several times of uh, the multiplicity of forms. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you can have sort of a recap recapitulation under a new form without losing um, losing identity or the addition of a new form. yeah I mean I think I think for uh, I think with the issue of of evolution now it seems pretty clear that uh, Saint Maximilian would not have accepted um, what is commonly called a uh, micro a macro evolution or inter interspecial evolution he didn't he didn't accept that on theological and philosophical grounds um i think it's um uh, i think it, it would be it will be interesting to see when father peter's seventh volume where he deals with origins and he discusses a theory of evolution that doesn't map on to um neo-darwinian evolution um nevertheless he understands that there is a rationality to evolutionary theory, but one has to be very careful with the metaphysics that one <clears throat> applies or presupposes in discussing evolution. And for, for St. Maximilian, and really for the Franciscan school, I think their emphasis on exemplary causality, and then the emphasis on the the creation as ultimately a semiotic manifestation or, a, or a, a sign of God. Everything is primarily a sign of God and <clears throat> whatever is created is willed by God to be first a sign of himself. Um, they, would, they would say that there, there is a priority of the essential that in a sense, structurally or ontologically precedes the existential in the sense that all things exist as willed by God, who wills with a perfect knowledge and a perfect love. So in that sense, whatever is created is already going to be, let's say, at the first instance of creation, it's going to be front loaded with the imprint of God and the intelligibility of God in order to manifest his will throughout creation. So in that sense, God always creates a what and then brings this into existence to develop in terms of what he created and what he wills for that thing. And so in this sense, with the um, Marian fixation and the movement to the point that you're saying with uh, St. John Cassian, um, the simplification is really uh, a recognition of A, the finitude, of our own conceptualizations and the fact that there is an order, a mediatory order between memory and will, and that is intellection. So you, you cannot will that which you do not know, and you cannot love that which you do not know. And so in a sense, in the revelation of Christ and Mary, what you have is you have the perfection in the spiritual realm of grace and divine love and human love at its outset. So in a sense, their, their primary, uh, their, their, they are the realization of the eternal purposes and paradigms of creation as such, even if Adam and Eve and it came first. So in, in that sense, there is a priority of the intelligible and the lovable over development mm -hmm. because Christ and Mary are constituted full of grace. Okay, 
and Christ as the God-man. So there, whether or not you get into discussions about Christ's knowledge, the development of Christ's knowledge, what he knew, what he, what he willed uh, concretely in the world throughout his life, how he developed in knowledge, there are theories about that, and there are many, many different opinions. Or with Our Lady, we know dogmatically that they both were created, Christ in his human nature, and Mary as a created person, right, with the fullness of the graces of the Holy Spirit. And that means that the Holy Spirit resided in them perfectly, as in temples, and that their will, whether or not act active or just habitual, I think active, but that's a discussion we can have later, their wills were always in perfect conformity to the will of God. So whatever comes later in terms of development will always be a movement back towards that ideal and that priority. And so in that sense, just as creation has everything in it that unfolds through the continuous progression and development, so also the church begins with the new creation and then progresses back through in terms of its own development back towards that. So I think... <clears throat> I think it's very important to understand then when you have this movement towards simplicity, it's not as though it's not as though you're you're becoming more ignorant or 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 stupider. It's 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 rather that you're seeing the order and the beauty manifested in God's creation and then God's salvific purposes in the church as flowing from and ordered back to and through Christ and Mary, which are ultimately then manifestations of the missions of the Son and the Spirit at extra. And so you have the, the simplification is recognizing that the prime ideas of Christ and Mary already contain at least virtually all the treasures that we think. So it's not as though you dispense with the treasures like knowledge of creation, knowledge of science, knowledge of philosophy, but you understand their relative subordination to the primacy of these two persons, the, 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 the king and the queen mother. And then you see how all of these are fit within them. And so the fixation then becomes a recapitulative process that can be contemplative or it can be academic. The academic mode is going to be in a process of reflection. The contemplative mode will be in a process of prayer and uh, an, an, an accent on the affective moment. But again, because you can't love what you don't know, you can never simply dispense with the academic mode, especially if you're called to a life of teaching and ministry. You have to have that. But I think that simplification is this process of recapitulation and ordering all of these things to Christ. And I think another point um, <clears throat> in terms of, it's important to understand in terms of the incarnation itself. Now, Jesus Christ in his humanity, right, in the assumed humanity, was the primary term of the mission of the Son, right? And so he, he in a sense, well, he's, he's a human. But we also have to understand that the mission of the Son was not merely to take on human nature. It was to mediate and give the Holy Spirit in order to build up a bride. You see what I'm saying? Are you following? So the mission of the Son was to become human, but also to send the Spirit. And what's the Spirit? Well, the Spirit is terminating in his bride, the glory. Remember, the, the, the Spirit is the complement of the Trinity. The woman is the glory of man. The, the Spirit um, <clears throat> adorning the bride, the church, and Mary as the paradigm paradigmatic bride, the queen mother, um, is in a sense the culmination and fulfillment of the mission of the Son to send the Spirit, and thus carrying the mission of the Spirit through the Son into the church. And here's where you get into, again, the original recreation. Mary is the paradigm. She's the source. But again, if you, but if, but if you look at, say, the progression in the New Covenant through the book of Acts and then culminating especially in the, the last chapter of, of Revelation, where you have the new Jerusalem coming down. In a sense, Mary is at the beginning, and Mary is at the end, insofar as the entire church, through this progression, through the continuing mission of the Son to send the Spirit, and the Spirit's continuing mission in a Marian mode, a maternal mode in the church, the church becomes like Mary, right? Because the church is the bride of Christ, and the church corporately gives birth to Christ in themselves. They become perfectly conformed to Christ 
and then they become the beloved of the father as bride, as adopted, not as natural son, but nevertheless, they're twins, they're spiritual twins, just like Jesus and Mary were, so to speak, spiritual twins. And that's why there's a spousal relationship or bridal relationship um, that is on the spiritual level, not on the, um, the physical or conjugal level. So these terms are being used in analogical ways to make certain points in the realm of theology and spirituality that are only typologically reflected in the natural order and even in the sacramental order. So I think you're, you're making a very interesting point. And I think what this is all bringing to mind is <clears throat> the, the, the typically Franciscan approach to questions of metaphysics and epistemology that move into uh, spirituality. And this is again. This is all. This is all Saint Maximilian. This is what he's. This is what he's articulating. And uh, scholars and theologians like Father Peter Leone Voite work these things out in different idiom. So Leone Voite works it out in the philosophical idiom with respect to the critical question. Father Peter recapitulates the insights of Bonaventure as brought forward through the the effects of Descartes, Kant, and Hume, and all of that difficulty and real questions that were raised about the relationship between the mind and reality. He brings, the, the Franciscan school always recognizes there is a kind of critical problem. And this is something that sets them apart from Aristotelians and Thomas. They see there's something there that they're getting at. And so what, what um, this question is also raising with this movement towards simplification, is the recognition articulated by St. Bonaventure and by Duns Scotus in their own ways that you need some form of divine illumination in order for even a, a, a unique rational, not supernatural, but rational mode of concursus of God to rational creature for there to be a justification of created rationality. Because simple abstraction doesn't really get us to the ultimate answer. And so Leone Voite dealing with Kant and Descartes and Hume, you know, Descartes, radical dualism, Kant, a split between things in themselves and things as we experience, and then the positing of the categories, and Hume, a skepticism about causality. All of these things are, are dealing with the same point, because what they all presuppose is the subjection of the personal, the voluntary, and the affective to the natural. Um, and so what, what the Franciscan tradition is trying to accomplish is articulate a, an, an understanding, a theological anthropology that articulates the primacy of charity. And this works out. So um, St. Bonaventure says you need illumination. Duns Scotus says, well, Henry of Ghent really created difficulties with the language of illumination because it ended up uh, producing a kind of fideism and or a fideism about faith and a skepticism about our knowledge of the natural order. Illumination maybe isn't the best idea. You don't have to agree with them, um, but he posits the notion of being, intuitive cognition of being in itself. And this notion of being in itself is asymmetrical to our concept of any other kind of being or individual being. All things compare to being, but being compares to nothing else. And so in that sense, it's a meta empirical place of knowledge. So it functions similarly to divine illumination insofar as divine illumination is just saying that created persons are created in first act as rational with the lights on. They don't necessarily know anything, but there's knowledge, there's rationality. Skoda says, we don't necessarily know any being when we know being, but it's the first object of our knowledge and it stands at a relatively meta position to all empirical knowledge that's gained through abstraction or concrete experience. And so they're dealing with this. And what, what this movement towards simplification and this movement towards conformity to Christ and Mary is a recognition that the flux and contingency of the created order, though it can give knowledge, it doesn't explain certain judgments. And ultimately we need recourse to a, an infinite reality in which you don't have the real distinction between thought and thing in God. God's ideas are simply God. 
God's thinking is simply God. And so in that sense, when you don't have the real distinction, you have real unity and infinity, you can, you can then understand distinction in unity. And then we can say, oh, well, the certain judgment ultimately about my inner state of being and some reality that is not me is ultimately grounded in God himself and his creative will. And so how do we access that? How do we make judgments about that? And how do we move from the abstract, the universal, the merely logical, to the real and the concrete? This is how, this is how Voite tries to um, bring Bonaventure into conversation with modern philosophy. It's how do, we, how do we actually, there is a critical question, how do we make judgments? And what, I, what, I, what dawned upon me as I was reading through some of this material um, is that uh, Udicare or de Udicatio and Bonaventure, judgment in English, well, I don't know what it would be in French off the top of my head, um, is, the same, is the same word as judgment in Greek. It's krisis, right? Judgment. But what is the critical question? The critical question then ultimately, etymologically, is about judgment. How do we make judgments? It's not where our, our ideas come from. It's how do we make personal judgments? about our inner states in relation to the world? How do we make judgments about the identity, intentional identity of thought and reality? And ultimately, how does our knowledge of the concrete come about? And so this is Voite, and this is movement, this is this movement up towards simplicity that ultimately the recognition is, is that, that God, even in the order of nature, is required for there to be critical knowledge of things. And uh, Father Peter says, well, ultimately, then, the, the critical question is not, is not really one of, do I know something or not? No, everybody knows they know. It's ultimately the, the, the stance one takes as the created image to the source of that image. And so for Father Peter, it becomes, is, is my stance as a knower, is it going to be rooted in pride and hubris, or is it going to be rooted in humility? And flipping that or applying that to the academic mode is how do, I, how do I maintain the love of learning and this intellectual pursuit, the pursuit of the abstract, and this radical desire for God? Because what you have in, in the intellect is abstractions, generalities. But what's the object? Well, it's the concrete love of God, and it's the concrete love of God in and through the manifestation of God's wills, God's will in Jesus and Mary and the economy of salvation. And so this simplification is not a call to ignorance, it's a call to order. And it's a call to order based upon what God has actually done in recognizing its beauty and fittingness. And this is why, this is why for the Franciscans, the theological project is not ultimately one of strict deductive science because the theological project is already predicated upon the will of God as it's manifest and reasoning after God manifests himself and trying to understand the beauty and fittingness of his ways and trying to form a coherent account based upon what has been taught and revealed of what is an explanation of the beauty. And so the theologian's role is to articulate and unfold the beauty of what God did and give persuasive reasons, even perfectly logically valid reasons but already within the context of the, uh, the, um, the beautiful and the contingent. And this is why ultimately the judge of any theological conclusion is not the inner logic of the theology because the premises are contingent and we don't, we don't fully understand their basis or their implications as such. And so God set up a magisterium ultimately to make judgments. This is why Scotus can say, I think these reasons are perfectly good and valid for the Immaculate Conception, but I don't have the authority to declare them binding upon the church. And so I think um, the, the, the Franciscan project now is to, and this is something articulated by Father Peter, reflecting on St. Bonaventure, St. Francis, Blessed Duns Scotus, and St. Maximilian especially, but also John Henry Newman, is he's trying to draw together all these threads, and he's trying to engage in this recapitulative process to show how philosophy, the philosophical anthropology, and our theological 
content as well as method is ultimately somehow ordered from and ordered to in the economy, the Trinitarian dynamic of the Immaculate Conception, the Divine Maternity, Christ, and the Church. <clears throat> and so he's trying, to, he's, he's trying to articulate a vision of how not only to understand this, but how to conform ourselves perfectly to this vision. And this is where St. Maximilian calls the first page is the absolute primacy, the Immaculate Conception, and hence the Divine Maternity. And the second page is being taught perfectly and following the orders of Our Lady. And what's the order of Our Lady? Do whatever he tells you at the wedding feast at Cana, right? And so this is now, we, we, don't just have, we don't just have the intellectual apparatus. We don't just have the habits of faith, hope, and charity. We're actually actuating and living those habits in second act at a, at a psychological level through conscious appropriation and conscious conformity to what we know is the will of God in terms of the revelation of the incarnation and the immaculate conception. And of course, everything that that entails. So that gives us, it gives, it, it pre presents a radical simplicity because clearly when we understand that all of these realities, Mary kept all these things and treasured her, treasured them in her heart and our Lord in Colossians, right? Is the firstborn of everything, reconciling all things in heaven and on earth. When you, when you see all of these things and through whom and in whom all things were created, right? The first chapter of John, when you recognize the, the ordered unity as origin, middle, and return of all these other things, it gives that fixation. But the fixation is not, um, again, an ideological diminution or contraction. It's a solid disposition of the will. So I understand where these are coming from. I understand where all these truths I know are going. And I love Jesus and I love Mary because they gave these truths to me. And these are the reason these truths exist. And so the, the simplification is one of affection. And this is exactly carrying on what the patristics teach. It's an ordering of the passions and of the curiosity of the intellect. It's an ordering to the love of the Father and of the Son and of Our Lady in the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so I, I don't know, I, I, that's, that's, a, that's a large present, that's kind of a large presentation, but I think responding to what you said about Cad, uh, Cassian uh, is, is quite important. <clears throat> Yeah, that was my understanding of simplification was not the jettisoning of what was known. And the book I read on Cassian emphasized that you need to read his more negative works through his De Incarnazione, where he presents a Christology and presents it as a very important thing for the monk. And it shows that. And then also they say with his emphasis on reading the scriptures and meditating on the scriptures that it shows that he's not just sort of doing a, uh, you know, I don't know if the author was Protestant, but it was in the fifties. So I think it was during that beginning of the desire to de-Hellenize theology. And so there was this back and forth is were the Egyptian monks, just Neoplatonists that also happened to have been baptized before they went out into the desert. And the final judgment of the book is, well, I'm not super happy about the influence on uh, Greek dualism and Christian spirituality, but the monks were Christian and they were searching Christ, not just um, uh, whatever. Um, Anyways, something I think, you made. I think two things. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna. I'll just say two things. I think uh, is one. One thing would be very helpful is, especially if this author was Protestant. I think the intertestamental literature, the so-called intertestamental or the deuterocanonical uh, literature, is very important in um, unveiling and demonstrating or showing how uh, the Old Testament covenantal thinking uh, interacted with Greek thought 
And I think there was a, there was a, a clear synthesis and a priority clearly given to uh, covenant and the fatherhood of God and the hope for the Messiah. But nevertheless, a lot of these categories were just simply human. And you, may, you can make the argument that um, a great, well, of course, this is obvious, the, the great proportion of our anthropology and natural law is rooted just as much, and, and I would say almost certainly more so, in the Pentateuch as it is in Greek thought or Neoplatonic thought. And so, yeah, I, I don't, I, I see the dualism and I see the concern uh, as real, but I don't see it as, a, I, I really don't, I think the Hellenization of Christianity is something that was uh, invented by somebody like Harnack in the, uh, the early 19th, the early 20th century. And I don't, I don't see it really conforming because the dualism for Christianity was simply resolved in the recognition that God is infinite in himself. And we are finite. Everything that's not God is finite. But the disjunct of being in terms of infinite and finite were united substantially and existentially in the, the divine person of the word. Infinite nature, finite nature. And so, yes, of course, there is a dualism. But the dualism is resolved in the unity of the person. And then in personal unity. Or unity between persons. Through, through charity. Um, so yeah, you were gonna say something else though, sorry. Yeah, I'm just looking for any points in particular to drill into it, within the introduction itself. Well, um, I think I, I, have, I have notes on the on the introduction um i didn't know if it was important to go through those notes because in some ways uh they'll they'll be they'll be taken at greater depth uh in in the treatment of the chapters themselves and um but i think it's important to understand that the main opposition at least in father peter's retelling to saint maximilian was twofold remember he said one the order is not essentially marian and two if you make the order marian and you make the mi or its equivalent, say, in the Franciscans of the Immaculate, if you make it central to the order, you will, in a sense, subvert the order from a Christocentric to uh, a Maria-centric. And so, in a sense, you will change the nature of the order. And so, St. Maximilian's task then, and of course, he was, when he was responding to these objections, Father uh, Bede Hess was the minister general of the Franciscans, and he completely agreed with St. Maximilian's analysis and the historical rootage of St. Maximilian's understanding of the founding nature and history of the order over against what would might be considered more minimalizing or minimizing positions on the place of Mary in the order. And so this is a truly historical question on what the foundation of the order is. What's the, what's the point of the order? What was it for St. Francis? But it opens up two very different conceptions of theology. And I think if you don't, if you don't accept something like St. Maximilian's account. Now, I, 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 this is this again, this is just theological opinion. And so it's subject to the judgment of the magisterium. And there are clearly other theological schools. But what St. Maximilian allows for is a powerful integration of both. Christocentric and ecclesiocentric Mariology, whereas in many of the other articulations don't allow for that um, integration. So you tend to emphasize ecclesiocentric Mariology or Christocentric, a high Mariology or a low Mariology. And I think in the, in the, in the, in the uniquely Franciscan formulation, which I think is borne out by the texts, um, amongst all the major branches of the order, I think you have this, this possibility for a Kolbian and Felnerian type of synthesis, wherein you have really uh, a, a realization theologically and a kind of blueprint or roadmap for the understanding and then implementation of Lumen Gentium in terms of both, in, in terms of a non-denial and a non-overemphasis of one side or another of the ecclesiocentric or Christocentric Mariology. And so I think that's very important because he's responding. The, the objections are precisely the same today as they were then. In that sense. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, I think it, it, it will be good next week to incorporate, and I think uh, Andrew will, will appreciate this, uh, incorporate uh, some of Bonaventure's uh, collations in Hexameron, the collations on the six days, because that's where he articulates his theology of history and how uh, St. Maximilian, who is very familiar with all of the contents of the critical edition that contains that work, how St. Maximilian uh, engaged and uses uh, St. Bonaventure's truly uh, developmental uh, sense uh, of, of, of church history. And so in this sense with the, the, the Franciscan school, you have a truly optimistic, an optimistic vision of church history, wherein with, with St. Augustine, you were left with kind of two cities always going in parallel till the end of time and the city of man getting really big and the city of God getting, getting big. And then there's this, this ultimate clash in history, but really the order and perfection is something that happens outside of history, the order and perfection of the church. Well, St. Bonaventure really articulated on biblical grounds and typological grounds, according to his own methodology of capitulation, recapitulation of these realities, types, and events and structures of scripture, he actually articulated a very optimistic view. He said, there, there will be a time of relative peace and a time of relative manifestation of um, the um, kingship of Christ in and through the church. It's not, it's not, history is not one long defeat. And St. Maximilian uh, brought this forward in terms of the second page, the incorporation of the Immaculate Conception into the life of the church, and what he called the age of Mary and the Spirit, or what Saint, say, uh, Father Peter called the age of Mary and the Spirit. But what's so interesting is this is, this has become a, a relatively minority position in the church today. But it's a very plausible position, according to the 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 um, structure of Scripture itself, and if you look at other figures in church history. So the issue here is: How do you understand a truly optimistic and progressive metaphysics or historical theology or theology of history, while not falling into a Joachimism? You know, how do you how do you square those? How do you how do you not overemphasize uh, a Marian age or a pneumatological age of the church against the Christological and institutional and sacramental age? And here's again where St. Bonaventure and St. Maximilian and Father Peter are very helpful in bringing this forward and maintaining a sense of balance, a sense of order. And it clearly is. You know, in, in, in these times that are difficult, to, to say the least, in the world, I think a recognition that there's just as good a case and likely a, a better biblical and theological case for hope and optimism in history and uh, an age of relative peace, I think, that's, I think that's a timely message today, and that's something to, to, to strive for. Is, is preaching the gospel and expanding the gospel and really seeking to um, incorporate uh, the spirit in one's own life and to uh, do one's best to um, gently persuade others to, to, to take the same move because the, the witness of scripture and theology seems to say that if we don't do it, someone else will accomplish this work. So why not us? You know, it's not a long defeat. We don't have to be in despair. Even if even if certain times are 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 difficult, <clears throat> and uh, I, I you know clearly something that arises here is again and we've talked about this is the whole issue of the use of the terminology of transubstantiation into Mary. Um, you know that's something that will have to have to be gone over. But again, I, I don't think we need to revisit that here. But this is something that's brought in as the particular way of expressing the unconditional and total um, consecration to Mary and thus the total and complete unconditional desire to follow and to conform oneself to her will as it's manifested in, in the life of, in the, life of the, 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 the individual believer and the uh, individual re religious. 
one, uh, one interesting point that is made, and this again has been brought up before, is for St. Maximilian, and we discussed this in a past um, meeting, is St. Maximilian, <clears throat> he brings up the idea, and of course this has been de debated forever, um, with the reform movements amongst the conventuals through the, the, the 14th and 15th centuries, all the way up to the, the 16th century, and then you have the first division between, well, you actually earlier, you have divisions between the observants and the conventuals, and then you have the Capuchins, and that it was all basically <clears throat> over the question of poverty. And this seems to be something intractable uh, in the Franciscan order, that's one problem. And then the second problem Father Peter brings up is the tendency, <clears throat> um, the, the tendency to towards this kind of um, arbitrary voluntarism amongst Franciscans. Uh, he admits both of these realities. And so the, the, the issue is because the emphasis is more on the effective, right? And on the spontaneous, and charismatic, it runs the risk of becoming a little unhinged, but it's a very dynamic reality. And I think actually <clears throat> it conforms more to um, the human situation as such. People tend to be free and to, if their freedom is not ordered through knowledge of the truth, they tend to go a little off the, off the rails uh, to, to one degree or another. And so I see no reason why that shouldn't occur in the Franciscan order, um, <clears throat> if the proper safeguards are not met and kept. So these are two very important issues. And what what St. Fran what St. Maximilian and St. Uh, <clears throat> Bonaventure and Scotus really emphasize is this theological anthropology of the unity and order of the faculties. And the unity and order of the faculties terminating through love in relationships with real persons in a context of a real and living church. And so where St. Francis, where St. Maximilian recognizes that poverty and aberrations tend to arise and become issues in the Franciscan order, he says the only, the only solution for resolving the question of poverty and disunion is Our Lady. And so why is that? Why does he think that's the case? That's a, that's a very important topic that can't be fully explained uh, within the context of these courses, but it's something to, I think, take seriously and consider. Why does St. Maximilian think this? And then how do I understand this in relation to those within the order or within the broader Franciscan family who are opposed to this? You know, if, I, if, if one is committed to this or if I don't agree with them, if I think really this is exaggerated, well, do I understand his position? Because you do have you do have the reality of very extreme and exclusive sounding language that you think, well, man, I don't know. I, that sounds a little extreme. Maybe I should maybe I should mitigate. Maybe I should modify it. <clears throat> but of course, Saint Francis himself could sound rather extreme at times. But uh, but he was the gentlest of souls. He wasn't in any way a tyrant. So I think I think it's something to that's worthwhile meditating upon and thinking about is that claim of St. Maximilian historically that it really is Our Lady who has to be the unifying principle. And it has to be as an explicit principle and cause within the order if the order is ever to be unified. And of course, there's, there's been attempts and there's ongoing attempts to bring the three um, major Franciscan, the, the, the conventuals, the OFMs and the uh, Capuchins back into some sort of broader unity. Um, ongoing attempts and discussions, and of course, the other Franciscan families, including the FI, there, there, that question remains, you know, how we're, how we're all sons of St. Francis, but yet we're at each other's throats, not, not literally, that's, that's changed a lot, but of course we have been in the past, as you know. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Uh, hey, Dr. Goff? So, yes. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Is, am I no, I, if you don't, if you don't interrupt, I won't stop talking because I get nervous with silence. There's no such thing as a dynamic silence for me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sweet. Um, I, I did want to, I, I remember when I was uh, my first year of postulancy with the friars, uh, when Father Lewis was the uh, uh, postulant master, he kind of brought up that question about um, 
St. Maximilian kind of solving the solution of poverty relative to Our Lady. And I remember reflecting on it and like presenting an, an answer to him that, <clears throat> that he happened to like at the time. And my thoughts were that, you know, Colby's whole idea of being the property and possession of Our Lady and this idea of the portiuncula, like the little portion. And you even think of in the Psalms where it says, God is my only portion. Um, and it made me think that like, really at the end of the day, the perfection of poverty is really this idea of being the little poor one of Mary is really the idea of each individual, let alone a whole community being her property and possession. At that point, you've interiorly speaking, you've perfected poverty, like blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I mean, you might say there's always, because at the end of the day, you can't solve the solution of poverty through like mathematical analysis of material objects. It can't be like, oh, you have, we have this and this, our friary looks like this and this, whereas our friary is this and this. Like at what point, uh, what, what is ultimately gonna determine um, the level of, po of material poverty? Because at the end of the day, you might as well just go sit in the grass with absolutely nothing and say like, I'm poor and not do anything, you know, it can't, so it can't be reduced to like this empirical quantitative analysis. It has to be a more metaphysical or at least spiritual reality. And um, I also remember reading St. Louis de Montfort where he talks when he's talking about total consecration to Mary and he's describing the vows of poverty, chastity and obedience that religious take. And he even goes on to say the vow of like the cloister for certain more contemplative monks. And he says, even after all that, the one who consecrates himself to Our Lady gives up even more because they're giving up their own intellect, their own will, their own spiritual possessions. None of those things which, I mean, you don't have to vow per se. When you enter religious life, you don't have to vow to give up your spiritual possessions, like your merits, your um, whatever graces you've been given, et cetera. It's even off to consecrate your own prayers as it were to our lady so that she can dispense with them how she wants. So at the end of the day, for one who's, and this is why I think when it does come to poverty, you don't, it, it doesn't make sense to pit the charismatic dimension against the institutional as if it's one or the other, but at the same time, the order between them has to be respected. So that's what I like about the Franciscan school is, and Father Peter talking about the Marian vow is the primacy of the charismatic over the institutional, or we say the primacy of the will over the intellect. It's not a will or intellect. It's just a matter of relative primacy and proper ordering between the two. So if we view, if we take that idea and even seeing it in St. Louis de Montfort, um, this idea that this total stripping of spiritual possessions, intellect, and what you're actually giving more at the end of the day, it's only when each consecrated or each religious or each lay person has really lived out the interior dimension of total consecration and has really like embraced that, that the resolution will happen. Because at the end of the day, it has to be interior conviction and interior choice. Like the solution's not going to be solved from without, as it were, through like less material goods or whatever. There's going to have to be a unity of mind and heart and will, like amongst a community, kind of like that early right. apostolic poverty. Um, so that was yeah, I, uh, yeah. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, I was, I was, I, I, I think what you've, I think what you've touched upon. And as soon as you started speaking, um, and I, you ended up, you ended at the conclusion. I think what is needed is in conjunction or as a condition for living out and resolving the issues of poverty in light of um, the um, incorporation of the Immaculate Conception into the life of the order in the church, um, <clears throat> in order precisely to avert those tendencies towards a kind of volunteerism, a, a kind of charismaticism, a, a cult of personality that is a, is, an, is a genuine risk within uh, Franciscan lifestyle is uh, the other side of, of Father's main presentation. And again, this is where we take in the uh, intellective mode, the magisterial mode, the teaching function of Mary as 
manifested in and articulated through the sanctification of the intellect. And so I think important for recognizing voluntary or voluntaristic tendencies is those friars and all friars given the, given the uh, calling and ability to sanctify their intellect in the Bonaventurian mode. You know, because of that, in, that, that typically Franciscan philosophical anthropology that's manifested both in the philosophical analysis of the relation of the powers of the soul, but then recapitulated or hierarchized in what Bonaventure describes in terms of the triple way, the, the, the purifying, uh, the illuminating, and the unitive modes of, of, of spirituality working in conjunction. But it's not, it's not a jettisoning jettisoning of, of intellect. It's the sanctification of intellect. It's precisely seeing intellect as ordered towards love, true charity. Now, the issue here becomes, and I think, I think with superiors, if they undergo the same sanctification of the intellect, this will also avert tendencies towards um, uh, laxity or severity, um, arbitrary commands versus ordered commands. <clears throat> but having this dynamic of a true sanctification of the intellect will allow for mutual reflection between persons of what is the right order. So, of course, you can't get away from the subjective. And so everybody could be just engaged in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an exercise of special pleading, and then it be, can become prideful and self-deceptive. Even So one can believe that he's sanctifying the intellect and his intellect is sanctified and have it actually be really prideful and um, rooted in uh, self-deception of some sort. So I think this is, this is where the Marian aspect, but also the strong emphasis on the preservation of communal life and uh, a deference to magisterial authority, really an imitation of St. Francis as he imitated Christ is important. So you have to be truly apostolic, meaning you're prophetically preaching the word, you're prophetically living the life, but you also have to be truly Catholic. And so it's this, it's this juxtaposition where in the primitive Franciscan order, you had the rise of the sanctification of the intellect through the work of St. Bonaventure, but you also had a life in common, which for blessed Duns Scotus, he said, this would have been the normative way of life if man hadn't fallen. So what the Franciscan order is actually trying to accomplish, or at least manifest, even though all Franciscans are fallen, is a, a true sanctification of the intellect, so we want an intellect like Christ. Remember, the disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ is the paradigmatic text in Bonaventure for what the human intellect is. So our intellect is supposed to be like Christ, the knowledge that Christ had. And <clears throat> to, to, to the degree that we can accomplish that. But also, the Franciscan order of community is one of commonality. And so when you bring up this no, you, no the, your, your Our Lady's possession and property, it does eviscerate and undercut the, 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 the drive for possession. But what it doesn't prevent against as such is the possibility of abuses arising within a community when those people either, when, when certain figures either don't want to follow that rule of consecration or they think they are following it, but in a sense, they're losing the apostolic or the Catholic side of that perspective. And so this is always a dynamic tension, but A, the, the common life is important, and then B, the desire, the true desire to sanctify the intellect is important because there, thereby there are a certain kind of, a, a certain system of checks and balances that allows for critical engagement and conversation when things seem to become, um, become off kilter slightly or misdirected slightly. But I think, I think your point is, is exactly uh, well taken, is that the sanctification of the intellect and seeking wisdom, not mathematical um, tables, uh, this, is, this, is only, this, this is truly the only way of, uh, of, of solving the question of poverty. But again, typologically and theologically speaking, uh, who is the seat of wisdom and who is wisdom incarnate? So yeah. Your, 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 your point is exactly right. And it fits hand in glove with the, with the Franciscan theological approach. No, thank you for that analysis, actually, that I appreciated that. Um, I did have one more thing I wanted to, to just bring up, and I'm glad, I'm glad that you uh, just brought up the, and I know it's in the introduction, the element of the theology of history and 
the cause of the Immaculate for Colby being at the, at the center of that and as a kind of golden thread of the historical process. And, you know, and then bringing up St. Augustine, I actually, funny enough, I just wrote, I literally just finished a, a paper for my patristics class, like a 15 page paper. And I did it on Augustine's theology of history and his theology of the two cities. And it's just funny, like reading his text, the city of God, and then like secondary literature, he really does have a different view than, than Bonaventure, you know? And I know Bonaventure himself, he references in like Collation 14, Augustine city of God and the contrast between the city of God and the city of Satan. So you know that he accepts in general, that he accepts that Augustinian distinction on principle. But the interesting thing is that Bonaventure does not develop his theology of history on the basis of that Augustinian principle, because he, he puts that in the category of the sacramental figures and then use the multiform theories to develop his theology of history. So you can, he accepts it like on principle, but he sees a different progressive view of history. And one thing that I've noticed in a lot of my readings of Father Peter is that he's constantly stressing the relationship between metaphysics and history, or I guess theological metaphysics and salvation history to give it a less philosophical, um, or to theologize it as it were. But he always stresses the primacy of metaphysics over history, the primacy of the order of the in, of intention in God prior to the order of execution or what's stable and unified before what's developmental, progressive, evolutionary. And I've noticed because, you know, as I told you, like I'm doing a lot of research on the theology of history, and this is the topic I hope to write my dissertation on with Father Peter, like Marian metaphysics and its relationship to the theology of history. But I've noticed in like a lot of like a lot of people in the 20th century, especially the Nobel Theology theologians started writing about the theology of history. So you see it in like Daniel Liu, you see it in Ratzinger, you see it in von Balthasar, Karl Rahner, everybody. And one thing I know Ratzinger in his Principles of Catholic Theology, he has a section talking about faith and history. And it's funny in the actual text itself, he says that history has a primacy or preeminence over metaphysics. And he puts in the, so he reverses the order of Father Peter, and it's and in one of the footnotes, he says, however, for those who hold to the scotistic position of the absolute primacy of Christ, they may have something different, but I will refrain from developing it here, and I was like, ah, you know, there's one thing, but at the very end of that work, in another footnote, he goes back and he says, if I were to rewrite this work, I would have emphasized metaphysics over history more, emphasizing the I am who am or the is of God prior to what plays out in history. But I think what I really appreciate so much about, because I'm reading Ratzinger and some of the others, like there's something in there that doesn't seem right. And I honestly think it comes down to this very simple um, idea of the primacy of, of metaphysics over history. And I noticed that within that general distinction of primacy, a lot of questions that will be brought up in the theology of history are also gonna be completely tied to that relationship. I think of, for instance, the relationship between grace and free will and the debates that uh, go on between that with uh, obviously the Dominicans and the, the Jesuits, but even nature and grace and the debates between Garigou Lagrange and Henri de Lubac, or if you think of the, debates over the development of doctrine, where you've got the logical theories versus these organic theories. And then I noticed that Father Peter always finds a middle ground between them. He never, he never goes, oh, you should do the Lagrange or uh, De Lubac, or you should do the logical or the or organic of Kangar, or you should do the, um, the grace, uh, the emphasis on, uh, uh, Banez versus Molina and he always comes back to like the the middle ground that's struck by Scotus and the personalist metaphysics and so one thing I'm thinking of with respect to development here as being such an important part in Bonaventure's progressive optimistic view of history and using the term evolution you know there's a sense in which if you don't understand that properly it, it can cause people confusion like if you say okay so History is just going to 
naturally evolve or organically develop into like this, this glorious end. But that's not even the way that Bonaventure and Scotus frame it. And with Father Peter, when in his writings on like evolution and talking about how Marian mediation is actually the basis for understanding evolution for this progressive development, because it really has to be personalist metaphysics, a personalist act, a, a personal act of mediation or hierarchization that raises something from uh, one level to the other in terms of action, not, not being, um, or at least like the mode of operation that they're, they, for instance, if we're speaking of development of doctrine, it's not just logical deduction, but nor is it just kind of some organic development that happens, but it's really an act of illumination, an act of mediation that contemplative theology uh, or mystical theology that really stimulates, you think of Colby's example, like this mystical theology now is stimu stimulates further theological ref reflection. And Father Peter would be a perfect example of developing his theology off of Colby's mystical insights or Bonaventure developing his theology off of Francis's um, mystical insights. So I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but I was to kind of just draw it back to a center. I really think that by Father Peter articulating the primacy of metaphysics or history, it really is like a, a kind of general vision in which all these debates over grace and free will, development of doctrine, um, et cetera, all these kind of, our nature and grace, all these dichotomies can kind of like be unified. It's like Father Peter introduces a third category and avoids just reducing it to like a, an irreconcilable dualism. But I don't know, I know that's kind of general and I'm not getting to like a main point, but I just, those are some of the things I've been reflecting on and trying to develop this, but. Yeah, well, I think that that's that's very great, and I think um, I think the main point you raise is the ambiguity in the term metaphysics, <clears throat> uh, because with respect to metaphysics, that that can carry. I mean, in in Aristotle, right? It's the third degree of abstraction, the highest form of abstraction, abstracted from all um, matter and form. That's that's a fairly innocuous uh, definition, but that definition, given as such, what are you left with? Well, you're left with an abstraction of an abstraction. And what I mean by that is you're just simply left with a very abstract notions. But what is real, what is real, what has existence are concrete things, right, in the world, individual items within a species or an individual rational um, agent or an individual prime mover. And so what metaphysics seems to be speaking about is abstract notions of being that are universal in their in their scope. And so I think when Ratzinger says he emphasizes history, what he means by is history as existential, like things that are real. But that's just basic, that's taking a certain notion of metaphysics as primarily or properly Greek or, or Aristotelian or pagan. You're dealing with abstractions here. And <clears throat> The, the notion, so then people want to emphasize history because they want to emphasize reality. They want to get away from essentialism, which are basically abstractions that can be so quickly, um, they can so quickly turn into ideology and authoritarian or tyrannical modes of thought that in a sense impose themselves upon history rather than dynamically interact, interact with history and in a sense, uh, quiet the voice of being because it's just an imposition from without. So people move away from metaphysics because they think abstraction, then they think uh, ideology, then they think totalitarian. And that's, 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 that's a real possibility. You hear the talk about the emphasis on, uh, we want to move away from essentialism. We want existentialism. And, and of course, in its most debased form, it actually ends up exactly where um, the ideological um, metaphysical approach ends up because you end up with nothing but you know will or nothing but passion or or desire you end up with very little meaning and so that ends up being very tyrannical and you know you have somebody like Hobbes developing a theory to deal with this social social situation where we're all essentially animals seeking our own base desires and we have to have an authority kind of keep us all down and organized like sheep um, and I think there's a real risk 
But what, what, you, what you have to understand with what, what, what Father Peter does is he says, well, actually, that isn't correct. And Ratzinger is correct when he says, I want to move back to the I am, because it's a statement of both person and being. And when Father Peter and the Franciscans are speaking of metaphysics, they mean these abstract universals. But they primarily mean, just like Christian revelation and revelation in the Old Testament, they ultimately mean substantial or subsistent reality or existent reality. Meaning, metaphysics is ultimately about not the divine nature, but the termination of the divine nature in the Father, communicating the Son, spirating the Spirit, living in this uh, eternal perichoretic or cir circumcessing life. And so metaphysics for the Franciscan is ultimately rooted in person. And what's the mystery of person? Well, persons have natures, and the natures are there by, um, are there by which the persons manifest themselves. But nevertheless, the person isn't simply reducible to the nature, right? Because the father isn't identical to the son in person. And in the same sense, so, so the issue is, is it's not a denial of essentialism. Essential is important. But within a Franciscan context, that essential or that essence is already a sign of the divine will, like we said a little bit earlier. It's a sign of what God is, as God is able to create and manifest himself or express himself at extra. And so the exemplary ideas for, for Bonaventure or the signs of the divine will for Scotus are ultimately rooted in a loving act of God outside of himself to manifest himself, to express something about himself in nature, and then to bring nature back into an order and unity with himself, ultimately realized in, in the incarnation. So when Father Peter is talking metaphysics and history, he's not talking about Aristotelian abstractionism or a kind of platonic essentialism. He's actually talking about the dynamic order of persons for which and in which all of nature is ordered. So it's highly existential because what is, it, what is, what is an existence? Well, it's, it's, it's taking Richard of St. Victor's definition of a person. Ultimately, a person is an independent existence of an intellectual nature. And this, this, this definition applies both towards a divine person and a human person. In, in finite entities, those existences are numerically distinct. But in an infinite being, those existences qua nature are numerically identical, even though really distinct as existences. And so for, for Father Peter, metaphysics is ultimately not about abstraction. Although you get to metaphysics through abstraction, you can't avoid it. But it's ultimately about the concrete reality of person, the Father eternally generating, inspiring the Spirit, and in the economy of salvation, the Father eternally sending the Son to become incarnate and to uh, build up the church. So I think, the, I think there are equivocal usage, uses of metaphysics and of historical, where Ratzinger is emphasizing he wants to get away from abstractionism to get to the existential and historical. But nevertheless, he recognizes then ultimately what we mean by the ultimate existential is the person of the Father. That's the ultimate existential, you know what I mean? And so it's going to be radically metaphysical, but the person of the Father is also radically concrete. He's real. He's not just an idea. So I think this is what uh, this is what Father Peter is, is is getting at, and it's something different than um, the typically pagan or Aristotelian notions. And it's a it's a full recapitulation and ordering of biblical, uh, historical, typological metaphysics um, over against more abstract or abstractionist metaphysics. But I think you hit the nail on the head is it's the question of metaphysics and its relation to history. But Father Peter presents a different approach that doesn't see these in dichotomy, but he does see a certain order based upon certain theological and philosophical commitments. Okay, no, thank you for that. Honestly, I didn't even see the, I mean, the, I know that Father Peter refers a lot to like a personalist metaphysics, or he talks about theological metaphysics based on typology or the typological method so is it almost fair to say then as opposed to just to avoid confusion to just say to pit metaphysics up against history and to qualify it, and really we're talking about a kind of revealed personalist metaphysics almost something like that well i think i think that i think that 
would work. But I, again, I don't think, I think what he would, what he would ultimately say is history um, unavoidably is tangled up in metaphysics because history is a manifestation of the divine will, which is inherently metaphysical. And so I don't think he would see them as an opposition. I think he would see history as the contingent mode of the metaphysics of contingent being. History is just the mode of contingency. And that, that has to do with what contingent beings are as um, created for God's purposes, which is ultimately love and unity. The only other point that I would simply raise is there's a there's a big debate and again it's i think over an ambiguous or equivocal use of the term person and personalism um classical theists will really push back on theistic personalism and theistic personalism personalists will say wait a second you're not even talking about a god we read about in scripture i mean how does how does this notion your notion of god how is this even able enter, to enter into relation? It sounds more like an Aristian, Aristotelian first mover or a platonic um, uh, one or a nous or the demiurge or demiurgos or urgos. But uh, I, think what, I think what you have to understand is that when Father Peter means person, he doesn't mean personalist. And what I mean by personalist is an analysis of what a person is based primarily on psychological introspection and finite psychological states. He would say, this doesn't work because psychology isn't pure metaphysics. Now it's an interface between mind and body, but it's not metaphysics as such because it's bound up in process and contingency, right? Um, I think we just lost uh, Fraud Joseph. <clears throat> so he would mean by person, and a personalist, he would mean the metaphysical definition of what a person is. And what that means is to have the pure perfections of memory, intellect, and will. And then he would have to articulate what those mean. Because clearly, when we operate through those powers, we operate through psychology, clearly. But psychology doesn't define those powers. And in a sense, psychology, especially fallen psychology, radically modifies the mode in which those powers manifest. So if we just take personalism, as really the key to understanding God, we'll start attributing fallen, finite human psychology to God, which is wrong. The classical theists are right. But the classical theists, I think, get wrong is when they do away with person as such. And they want to just talk about like God's uh, absolute simplicity, all of these general characteristics, these absolute attributes of God without like really explaining what they mean in any sense by a person, right? So I think, I think those are the two things. So I think, uh, again, it's an equivocal use, but when Father Peter means person, he means a precise definition of person rooted in the biblical revelation and uh, ratified, clarified, defined in the uh, councils of Nicaea, uh, Ephesus, Chalcedon, uh, and, and, the, and the like. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate that explanation. <clears throat> Uh, it looks like we lost uh, Fra, Fra Joseph. Did you have anything uh, to say? Uh, any more questions? I know, or or comments? I mean, I'm I've got a I have a few more minutes, and I think this is helpful. And we actually did make it through some of the uh, content of the book as well. I guess one thing that came up in class that you I wonder what you think of um, Father. Well, one of the Mariology professors. Um, is not favorable towards the analysis. I mean, we're just at the beginning of the course, so we'll see where he takes it, but he's not very favorable towards St. Maximilian's analysis of Mary and the Holy Spirit. He says, and again, like I said, I don't want to misrepresent a partially, partially unfolded lesson plan, but he's emphasizing more Mary and the Father as both being begetters of the son so he talks about you know the the womb of the father or the breast of the father i don't know what the greek is but it's both the seno seno and uh he talks about the womb of the father the the, the father pregnant with the son so these sort this sort of language and um yeah so i, I don't know if you have any familiarity with that in particular um yeah i i it, yes father peter actually does address that uh, i just came across it recently but i've been doing so much editing um 
trying to push for these volumes to be published uh, by the end, well, at least be submitted by the end of the, of the year that I don't remember exactly where I came across it. But I can sp say generally that the analogy between the paternity of the father and the maternity of Mary is no problem, right? There's no problem. There's an analogy. Univocally speaking, Mary is the natural mother of Jesus, according to his human nature. This is something that Bonaventure and Aquinas would disagree with, but Scotus and the Damascene would absolutely affirm. There is a univocity in meaning, qua human nature, to the father's fatherhood in terms of the mode of the divine nature. Now, clearly, those are infinitely distinct, right? Clearly. But the point is, is that Mary is true mother of Christ in his humanity, and father is true father of Christ in his divinity. And both of their paternity and maternity redounds to the hypostasis or the person. And the termination or, or, or the mode redounds to the, the, the nature that produces this. So according to divinity, according to humanity, but both terminate in the one person. And because of Christ's uh, divinity, obviously the, 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 the person, the personal termination of the communication of the divine nature of the father to the son via the mode of intellection or generation is going to be eternal and prior structurally. So thus Christ cannot but be a divine person, even if he has a human nature. Nevertheless, there can be true paternity or rather true filiation in both modes. So that's that's perfectly granted. That's actually it's a profound insight. But the question is, is that the father is from no one and the son is generated solely from the father. But Christ in his humanity is a creature. Not Christ in his in his Jesus Christ, when we say the whole composite, but in terms of his human nature, that human nature is a creature and creation is clearly appropriated to the spirit through the son from the father. And so you already get into the creaturely dynamic. So you have to deal with creation. Moreover, the, the mother is the mediatory principle, not the primary principle. Where the father is primary principle, mother is mediatory principle. Maternity cannot exist without paternity, in a sense, taking the initiative. This is something that's theological and it's something that's biological. The motherhood mediates the, 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 the child or the offspring, proles, to the father. The father generates the son solely from himself. The mother, oh, strangely enough, as mother, generates solely from herself, but it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. So in this sense, there is a, an, a, an, an analogy, but of course the mode is radically different. So it, precisely to explain, my, my response would be precisely to explain the similarity of the father's paternity and Mary's maternity, you have to have the Holy Spirit. And so if you put the Holy Spirit there, well, then what's the problem with Colby's explanation at that point? Because it's precisely the, it's precisely scripture gives us the witness. It's the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, and it's through the Holy Spirit that she brings forth the son that would be called the son of the most high. So I just think, you know, it's, it's like a non-issue. It's like, yeah, I, I grant everything you're saying. What follows from that? Nothing follows because it's precisely Christ's humanity coming from a human mother that requires the Holy Spirit. And moreover, if Mary's just like related to the Father, well, do we no longer have an economic trinity? Like she somehow directly relate to the Father independently of the, this generation of the Son and the spiration of the Spirit? I mean, what, what, I, I, honestly, I don't, want, I, I don't want to sound rude, and I'm sure this guy's read many books, but... <clears throat> I question his his training in the liberal arts and in uh, basic logic. So well, forgive me. Yeah, I think I don't know if he's trying also to emphasize certain things, but um, and like I'm I sure said, it might, be a, sure is, it might be a partially unfolded lesson plan because I could see. I mean, we're not too far into the semester, but I could see where you're. <clears throat> taking each person of the Trinity at a time and showing how their personal properties are reflected in Mary. So with the father, yes, she is generating. With the son, she is predestined. Daughter. With Christ, she is predestined, firstborn daughter. With, yes. And she's also generating. So she's both generated and generating. So again, like the son. So it's like she, in a way, she mirrors 
the father to the son and the son to okay. the father. And yes, then, of course, this is Father Peter, and this is St. Maximilian. Father Peter, the, the, the specifically Marian mode of the incarnation is a manifestation of the, of the Trinity as such. Father Peter has written on this in his essay in 1992-93 on the great sign. And so the Marian mode of the incarnation is a unique um, presentation of the inner life of the Trinity. Why? Okay, first of all, you have to go back and distinguish between proprium and appropriatum. An appropriation is the way we attribute um, two individual or distinct divine persons activities of the Trinity in common, right? Because all the Trinity acts whenever the Trinity acts at extra. And of course, the Trinity is perichoretically um, existing in interpersonal communion from all eternity. But nevertheless, the, the Father is the source from all eternity, eternally generating the Son, eternally inspiring the Spirit. Now, uniquely, Mary then is a great sign of the Trinity. Why? Well, because she generates right? She generates in a perfectly full sense without any diminution. She generates virginally. The Father generates without any diminution. It's a pure act of infinite perfection terminating in anotherly, another person that's now infinitely perfect. She also generates and <clears throat> through, this, through this perfect act, this virginal act, so she's perfect mother, but she's also perfect bride because precisely it's through the power of the Holy Spirit in this union of, 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 of love that she generates and brings forth her son. So in this sense, she is like the Trinity in terms of the processions of the, of the persons of the spirit of the son and the spirit from the father, precisely in the Marian mode of the incarnation. And so I think, again, there can be appropriations and you're exactly right to point out that Mary's relationship can be appropriated to each of the persons. I think you're exactly right. But in the economy of salvation, the appropriation to creation and recreation always moves through the spirit and then back through the son to the father. You don't, you don't have a relationship, even of our Lord and his humanity, right? That is not mediated by the spirit. So all ad extra is appropriated to the spirit, the father through the son in the spirit, spirit, son, father. And so, so I think what, what we can just assume is you just got this, this professor completely wrong and you completely misrep misrepresented his opinion. <laughs> Likely. I mean, that will be, we'll all be safe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because he's- And I won't be offensive. Because <laughs> he's, a, he's a very, uh, I mean, he's eminently known in the field. And- uh, well, yeah, Of course, very active. there are a lot of people like that. Yeah, but um, and I mean, I think he would agree with much of this. I don't know if maybe he's trying also to emphasize the um, the feminine principle, because I mean, that's one of his points: is that Franciscan Mariology is Saint Francis saying, "I want to imitate the poverty of Jesus and his mother Mary." And so that Franciscan, the Franciscan approach is always seeing both the masculine and the feminine. And it's not just the masculine alone, but there's always the presence of both in an order. And I think just one thing I wanted to mention in this topic about ordering, and we were talking earlier about history and metaphysics, that I've mentioned this before, but I think it's still interesting. It comes from something from Father... Angelo, where he talked about what is it about measure, number, and weight that God created everything in measure. That's from the Book weight. of Wisdom. Yeah, and yeah. so you have this like identity, diversity, and ordering, and I think that that can be applied in many things to basically to show that you can have something where there's a basic identity. And then, but within that, there's a you know a fundamental distinction that there's two modes that falls in between. But then that doesn't mean that there can't be order. And just because there's order doesn't mean that there can't be distinction and equality. And I mean, you can apply that to maybe maybe develop that in relation to history and metaphysics, or in relation to man and woman, where there's unity in the human nature, there's distinction in the two sexes, and then there's an ordering 
of the two within the context of the family or in the context of generation. And so it's not like they're saying they're different and equal destroys the, any idea of unit of order, but then also saying that there's a natural order to the relations of the sexes doesn't mean there's inequality. And so I think just sort of breaking apart the naturally or maybe hastily associated identity and order with the assumption that if there's an if there's an order, there has to be one has to be in some way inferior to the other. That's right. So yeah, I think oh, I think you're I think you're onto something, and I think uh, I, I it's precisely it's precisely the uh, the Franciscan notion of order, and it's not exclusive to the Franciscans, but it's you can say. It is part of their um, philosophical and theological apparatus that is explicit and um, systematic. And I think the notion of power is rooted in the notion of authority. And authority clearly is source. That's source. Something comes from this. But ultimately, authority is rooted in the father. And the father is what? Infinite. So in a sense, um, all paternity in heaven and on earth is named in terms of the father. And all maternity is obviously a reflection and an expression of that paternal goodness. And I and, and the, the 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 theological difference is that there is a certain kind of typological and um, metaphysical, not metaphysical, metaphorical um, statement to be made that is represented in in paternity and maternity between primary and mediatory, right? Not necessarily secondary, but primary and mediatory, because a mother is ultimately a mediator. In a sense, there's greater proximity of the mother to the child than the father is to the child, because it's precisely the mother that mediates that conception, development, and um, delivery of that child to and for the father. <clears throat> so that's one aspect of, of, of maternity is mediation. Now, God is not, um, the father is not a mediator. He is the source. Now, you might speak of the son as a mediator and the spirit as a mediator in different modes. Clearly, that's fine. You get the notion of mediation in the Godhead. But I think the other primary uh, significant of uh, the, the feminine or maternal principle is precisely the created mode of existence. So in a sense, to God, we're all women it, called to be mothers. We're all women insofar as we're created by God. We're fecundated by God. We bear everything we bring forth is from God through us, through our mediatory causality. And ultimately the calling is, is to mirror what was in reality in its fullness in Mary in actually bringing forth the God man. Paul says, I labor, I pray and labor until you bring forth Christ in your hearts. And so in that sense, Christ in his humanity was a woman to God, because as a creature, he has to have that feminine maternal aspect, but clearly as a divine person, he is God to creation, and so there's no, there's no issue there, because creation as such is typified through femininity, so we're all brides of Christ, we're all women to Christ, there's, so, so, so the feminine aspect, that's, that's very important to emphasize, because it's our primary mode of being, is bridal, and what does a bride do? It's united to the to the to the to the to the groom in order to bring forth offspring, spiritual, physical, whatever. And that's precisely the church. So I think those those points are absolutely important. And the the Franciscan charism has, has always understood the bridal import of um, of uh, the created reality. And in a sense, priests standing in persona Christi stand both with respect to his headship over creation, which he's still bridal in relation to God, but he also, they're standing in for the operation of a divine person. And of course, priests can't measure up because priests are all women too, because they're first faithful before they're priests and ministers. And so if a priest misunderstands this primarily bridal relation to the groom, then that priest, you fall prey to the same kind of deviations that we spoke about earlier, about a kind of voluntarism, a pseudo-mysticism, an enthusiasm, authoritarianism, all of these things. And so the priest has to first situate himself 
as first a member of the faithful, being wombed and uh, birthed and reared in the church. And then he can stand in persona Christi precisely as a sacramental mediator, not an end in himself. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> And so these, these are all very important aspects. And I, I completely agree with, with that emphasis. I do have concerns of, oh, I, I would just say uh, the generation of the father of the son eternally is sufficiently different from the generation of the son from Mary in time to for me to raise concerns about attributing and emphasizing in the in a, in a in a in a very unless you very carefully define how you're using these terms uh, to emphasize feminine attributes, but clearly, God is not sexed. Mary was clearly sexed. God is not a man or a woman. Mary was the woman. I mean, by, by sexed, I mean gender. Um, but obviously, that's a completely. It's a, yeah, it's a term for grammar, that is translated into biology. Um, so I, I try to keep that distinct. So I think I think those are reasons why I think one must be must be careful because in so emphasizing this femininity of God, you could end up undermining the unique and profound perfection of Mary's womanhood. Because Mary is a as the woman, as the perfect creature, she bring forth, brings forth the God man. She doesn't bring forth the God man like the father brings forth the son. And so that's important because. The generation of the son in time is inherently, inextricably bound up in human biological realities. The woman is a woman and a mother, and the son is a man and the son. And these are important. You do not want to um, do away with those signs, even if they create tension uh, in, in modern social situations, or even if they're difficult to explain. They, they're there, and they're, they have a certain priority because God did it. And so we have to first say, what is God doing here before we get concerned about um, uh, pleasing certain, certain theological or, or becoming acceptable to certain theological concerns? I mean, that's, 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 that's all I would say. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, one other point about this with you were saying with uh, the Franciscan tradition, seeing this bridal imagery is that if I remember correctly, I don't remember where exactly, but I think when St. Maximum is talking about the transformation of the faithful into Mary, he talks about how Mary reproduces herself in souls. So he doesn't just say that she births Christ in souls, but that she reproduces herself. Yeah, right. And then you bring forth Christ in your life. So that was an interesting point, point there about the bridal. Yeah, it's a very good point. And then um, moving... And again, like I talked about last, one of the last times we did about the three fiats of that make up the, the Christian message, where you have the yes of God to creation, <clears throat> to the whole economic thing. Then you have the yes of the human will of Christ. And then you have the yes of the human person, Mary. And those three are concentric, one's inside the other, and ours is inside the yes of Mary. And so then there's that transubstantiation where we're more perfectly taking on the yes of Mary. And then by doing that, we're more perfectly located within the yes of Christ. And then in that, we are like more perfectly within the eternal yes and the ad extra yes of the divine will. And um, so, yeah, so, I mean, that's an interesting, you have to have all three. Um, and if you take, if you kick the legs out, then eventually you just, everything falls. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't know if there aren't any more comments. I think maybe we should close with a, a word of prayer. Um, Fra Charles, do you want to say a, a Hail Mary or... Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, thank